Tonight's topic is also a very important topic. Madua Yesh Tzadik Beralo Rasha Vetovlo, very popular topic. Many people have asked this question, why does it appear at least that the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? And I emphasize it appears because it's not necessarily so. But appearances are deceiving and people are under this impression that uh, for some reason there are many good Jews out there, many good people, even non-Jews, who are doing everything right, everything correct, according to the Deen, according to the Halakha. They follow the Torah, and they're having a very difficult and perhaps even miserable life. And then we have many individuals who are not following anything whatsoever. They're wicked. They're not just ignorant. They're wicked. They're bad people. And it seems to be that they're getting away with it. God is not after them. Where is the punishment? Where is the God Almighty who supposedly supervises and is fair and just, exactly as we were taught? So this apparent contradiction or apparent difficulty is in a lot of people's minds because it has not happened once. It has happened many, many times. It happens all the time. So we have to understand what is going on, how to reconcile these differences, this apparent contradiction, and it's not a contradiction. The very first pasuk that I'd like to say is in Parshat Nitzavim, towards the end of the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu, before he passes away, gives us much advice, reminds us of what lies ahead, the, the many dangers. He actually knows the future. He knows what's going to be with the Jewish people. He knows that they will not be as strong as a leadership in the end of days especially, Am Yisrael will become more and more distant, less observant, less knowledgeable. And when that happens, of course, there will be more doubts in their emunah, in their faith. And as a result of that, a weaker attachment to tradition. He's concerned about that, and he touches on some very important points. One of them is, Hanistarot l'ashem elokeinu. Those things that are hidden, and there are many things that are hidden, are beyond us. They belong with Hashem. Our responsibility is to educate ourselves with those that are niglot, those that are revealed to us in the Torah, in the Talmud, and even in the Zohar. That part of the Torah which is revealed to us is our responsibility to know and to fulfill. There are many things that we don't know. There is a lot more that we don't know than what we know. As it is mentioned in the Kabbalah, look at the earth. There is much more water than there is earth. Put all the continents together, and you still have a lot more water than you have earth. Kabbalistically speaking, the water represents the sod, that which is hidden. After all, we do not see what lies below, beneath the surface of the water. Very, very deep waters, because there is more sod, there is more that is hidden from us than that which is revealed to us. Because in our human mind, we're not capable of fully understanding, fully grasping everything there is. Hashem does not, of course, want us to be aware of everything. We don't live long enough to know everything. And even if one would live a thousand years, he would never get close to knowing anything. In other words, comparatively to what there is to know. Some, of course, learn more, some learn less. But there's a certain part of the Torah that we don't have to bother ever trying to figure out because we will never get the answers. And it's not a good idea for us to occupy ourselves in that which is not our business. And that is the nistarot, that which is hidden. There are other interpretations to that pasuk. Then another classical interpretation is that we are not responsible for those things that we are unaware of. There may be something being done in the Jewish community that we're unaware of, something that is wrong. After all, if we know something is wrong, we have to do something about it, we have to correct it, we have to rebuke the individual or the community. So Hashem says, I'm only going to punish you, I'm only going to be upset at you for, as collectively, as a community, as a people, only for those things that you are aware of. Those things that you're not aware of, I'll take care of on my own. I ask of you to get involved wherever you're aware of that something is not right. That's the other interpretation, but the one that I want to talk about today that is important is one needs to remember at all times 
it is not possible for us to figure out to know everything there is. We do not have the answers to many, many difficult questions. We, have, we obviously have some direction. The Torah does give us some clue as to what the meaning of a certain event is, what is it supposed to mean, so we can examine ourselves and perhaps see if there's something to correct. Obviously, we do have direction. Not everybody, of course, learns the Torah. Not everybody pays attention to what is happening with them in their life. So therefore, they even have a more difficult time making sense of what's going on. Making sense of what's going on in today's world. World events. Without looking at the prophets, without learning the Gemara, without learning the Zohar, the Midrashim, you're clueless. You have to depend, you have to rely on what the newspaper is telling you. And that you know that that's all lies. That's never true. Or at least it's an exaggeration. In the same way that we've discussed in the past, that when it comes to Ta'amea Mitzvot, Ta'amea Mitzvot meaning the reasons behind the various mitzvot, even though we've talked about them for three and a half years, we've covered Baruch Hashem all the mitzvot, I've always said that, that no one is capable of understanding Hashem's ways, what He actually meant, what was the real purpose of the mitzvah, we also know that every mitzvah have, has multiple reasons, not just one. So what did we do for three and a half years? We gave an idea of what the mitzvah is trying to accomplish. Just one idea of perhaps many. But do we really know what Hashem's motives are? No. We know it's for our good. It's for our benefit. And this is how He wants us to live our life. And we know that if we do so, we will be rewarded. Nevertheless, the mitzvot, many of them are very difficult to comprehend, and they are called chukim, decrees. Because there are simple one common sense mitzvot, like honor your parents, don't steal, don't commit adultery, somewhat, is uh, understandable, is logical. But there are some that are not so common sense. But we accept them because we know that they are, they are the word of Hashem, the word of God. So there are many things that we do not fully understand. Nevertheless, we need to explain this as best as possible, especially to those people who are a little bit more distant, who may have had a tragedy in their own life, or you know, somebody that's very close and dear to them. We're not here to offer them a full explanation of any particular event, but at least some guidelines as to what certain things mean. And this topic of Tzadik Veralo Rasha Vetovlo is a very important topic. But I'm telling you right now that in order to fully comprehend the topic, in order to appreciate it, one has had to have heard various other lectures and topics that cover si similar themes, but nevertheless have important concepts and foundations in Judaism, just as much as this one. And they are that there is a creator. You have to assume that. We, we cannot explain to, we cannot begin to explain this topic to someone who does not have certain assumptions, certain foundations. So I'm assuming, I have to assume that most of you, if not all of you, know that there is a creator. That he is also a mashgiach. He did not just create the world and bail out, left. He's still around, he's aware, he supervises. He's actually involved in many capacities into what goes on in this world. This is an important principle. It is fundamental to understanding tonight's topic. That there is reward for mitzvot, schar mitzvot, that there is punishment for those who transgress the mitzvot, commit averot. Another topic is that there is such a thing as clear miracles, and sometimes not so clear miracles, nevertheless miracles, which is an act of Hashem. The topic of emunah and bitachon that we discussed already in the past, which means faith and reliance or trust in Hashem. We not only believe in Him, that He exists, that He created the world, we put our trust in Him, that everything that He does is for our good. These are very important topics that were covered already because they are fundamental to Judaism. And if one has any problem with them, it will not be easy for him to comprehend tonight's lecture. We talked about 
why the Jewish nation suffers so much, why they had so many hardships. That was also a topic that if, it, if, if it was heard, if it was understood, will help us understand tonight's topic. Why are the rich and poor was another one that was important. Why does the Kadosh Baruch Hu, why is he so more exacting, medakdek, with tzaddikim, with the righteous, much more than he is exacting with or demanding of others. And of course, the meaning of life, the meaning of pain and suffering in one's life. What's the idea of pain and suffering altogether? Anyone who had uh, exposure to some or to all of those, it will be easier for him to understand what is going on in this topic. Once we understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu supervises the world, what does that establish? She'en mikriyut, that there's nothing happening by, by random, by chance, right? Once we agree and we understand that he is a mashgiach, that he actually supervises everything, handles everything, is involved in everything, we also take it to mean that there's nothing that happens by itself without his will. Okay, if nothing happens without his will, then there's a reason for everything. Okay, there must be a reason for everything that happens. If there's a reason for something, then obviously the, the, the next question is, why is it that those very, very good people, righteous people, who are doing everything right under the sun, are going through such a hard time? But what if we just say there is a reason for it? Right? We just don't know what the reason is, right? But there is a reason. It's very important because once we agree so far that there is a reason, all we got to do is figure out what the reason is. Some people can't get to the point of there is a reason behind it. And they say, oh, it's random. Life is not fair because Chaz Shalom, there is no creator or, he, or he's not around. And everything is afkir. And therefore, to them, subconsciously, what they're really saying is, there's no right and wrong. What difference does it make? See, that's, that's where the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, leads one. He stops you by reason, a reason for everything. No, there is no. But once you, you go that far and say, yes, there's no, nothing that happens by chance by itself. There is a reason for everything. Okay, so far, so good. Now we've got to figure out, okay, then why is somebody so special that does everything right by the book is having such a hard time? And the other way around, too. Why is this man who's so evil, nothing happens to him? Where is the justice? So let's go back a little bit in history. When Am Yisrael left Egypt, Akadosh Baruch Hu took them through the desert for 40 years. Now, even though we know the 40 years was a punishment, they could have entered Eretz Yisrael right away. In the end, even those 40 years were beneficial. I call it a laboratory or school. They actually learned a lot of valuable lessons. Who is this God? What does he do? How does he behave? I mean, to know he exists is one thing, but to know what he's like is totally different. You think they knew what he's like? Right away, as soon as they left, they started complaining. Where's the water? Where's the food? Where is this? You know, they don't realize that if there is no water, if there's no food, you, you call him. You know, you pray to him, and that's what he wants you to do. After all, this is a lesson for the future when you don't have that direct, strong, keshe relationship with him where you can hear his voice, right, and see open miracles. What are you going to do when you're, you're fired from your job? You have no parnasa. You're going to complain, oh, this is no longer for me. I'm not interested in Judaism. That's it. I'm done with it. No, remember that there's a reason for that, and you can get back your parnasa. You may find a new parnasa. Call to him because he is the source of Parnassah. So they learned a lot of valuable lessons. One of the lessons that they learned is that this God Almighty is in charge of everything. He's the boss. He's in charge of all of nature. The Egyptians didn't think so. The Hindus don't think so. They actually think that there is a God of war, a God of love, a God of rain. There's a God for everything, for all the powers in the world. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad is therefore very important because what we're saying, what we're declaring to the world is that He's one. 
There's only one. There's nothing else. And Odul Vado, he's in charge of everything. All the kohot, including nature, all the powers are in his hand. All right. Where did we see that? We saw it in Egypt before we left. He controlled nature. He not only controlled nature, he had hail with fire together. Hail and fire don't blend, don't mix. I, he, I mean, he just basically showed them everything. Water turning to blood, frogs, lice, anything you want. He showed control over nature. But even though they saw the, how HaKadosh Baruch Sholet Bateva, he's in full control, and the Egyptians couldn't counter it. What they did not know, and they weren't sure about is, this God, perhaps, all he knows how to do is latet makot. He knows how to hit people. Is he also a benevolent God? Does he also know how to do good? In Egypt, they didn't see it. Right? What did they see in Egypt? Eser makot, ten makot, ten plagues. He knows how to hit. He knows how to punish. That they saw. That was obvious. Does this same God know how to do good? Is he kind? They learned that in the desert. Actually, they learned that in Kriyat Yamsuf. He split the sea. He gave them water. He gave them man. He gave them the slav, the quail. Right? He took care of them with the clouds. They never had to change their clothes. They didn't have to send them to the laundry. It grew with them. It was always clean. Even though they went barefoot in the desert, their feet were fine. The weather was perfect, air-conditioned. Everything was right. That's what the Medrash describes. That's what the, the rabbis explain. The conditions in which they were in the desert was perfect. So in the desert, they are experiencing God in many, many ways. They're actually becoming familiar with him, that he's not only in control, he not only can punish, he can also do a lot of good. Okay, so what's the Hidush of tonight's topic? The big Hidush, in other words, the additional point that we're going to get now that is different, that they were not aware of after learning and seeing all of what they saw, is that even the bad is good. That's a Hidush. That not everybody is aware of. Till today, people who have studied Torah, people who are very learned, they don't realize that even the bad that comes down, the plagues, the, the harsh judgment, that is actually good too. That is something new, perhaps, to some of you. You mean that is hard? That is good? When somebody is f feeling physical pain, that's good? Yes, and I'll tell you why. All of life, the Kabbalah says, our life, the entire creation of the world, is an act of love from Hashem. It's an act of kindness. You think He needs us? Why did He make this world? This whole world is an act of chesed. It's an act of goodness. The nature of good is to give, to be good, to be kind. Hashem is good. And he therefore, the nature of that goodness is to give, to bestow goodness. The Pasuk says in Megillat Echa. From above, nothing bad comes down into this world. Everything that comes down to this world is good. Who's the one that causes bad? Man. Man brings upon himself that which we call bad. But we still haven't defined what's good and what's bad. All I've said was that everything from above is good because God is all good. He's all love. And therefore, everything that he does, even that which is harsh judgment, that's always going to be good. Okay. Okay. Now we have to define what is good and what is bad. We spoke a little bit about this in the past, that good is something relative. What's good for you may not be good for me. What's good for me may not be good for you. The ultimate good is something which serves the purpose, serves creation. When God says this is good after everything he created, he meant this is complete, this is beautiful, this is just right. It serves creation. I created it for a purpose, even a cockroach. Yeah, even cockroaches, they are good because they serve some purpose. Otherwise, they would not have been created. Good, therefore, is something that serves the ultimate purpose. 
Therefore, when something good happens, what is the ultimate good? We define it as something that brings us closer to the tachlit, to the ultimate goal, to our mission, or something that gets us closer to him, because he is the source of all good. So an act of goodness, or something that is considered really, really good, what is it? If it brings us closer to him. In the spiritual world, in the world of souls, it's called cleaving to him. And that is what our wish is for those who have departed from this world, that they cleave. Right? We call it b'tsrora ha'im. Shetiyen nishmatam tsrura b'tsrora ha'im. That their soul should cleave to the eternal life, to him. And those who have left this world and who have come back, somehow they would like to come back, were able to describe this magnet that they felt of being attracted to this incredible light which they say is possibly the Shekhinah. The light, it's not a real light, but it's, it's, it's a very loving and warm feeling, a feeling of acceptance, a feeling of unity, of being drawn, be, wanting to become one, wanting to fuse with it. Just like two people who care so much about themselves, all they're interested is in themselves in becoming one, in fusing with each other, becoming one. And that is the feeling of being close to Hashem, a feeling that we cannot have in this physical world completely because here we are cleaving or being attached to that which is physical and material. But the neshama ultimately wants to cleave to where it comes from. The neshama is a chilek eloka mimal, it is a part of him. It is always drawn to him. And it always wants only to be with him, with the Shekhinah, with Hashem. So the ultimate tov, cannot be given in this world, the ultimate tov or goodness is only in the olam ha'emet. In the world of the souls, in olam haba, or in this world if it is something that draws us close to him. A ma'aseh tov, a good deed, a mitzvah draws us closer to him, therefore it's called something tov, something good. The reward that is given to us in the next world is of course a reward that can be called tov, because it is the real tov, it is the ultimate good, a certain goodness that has to do with the neshama, a certain goodness that has to do with the spiritual world, a goodness that cannot be described in earthly terms. We cannot even imagine what it's all about. But that is the ultimate good. So good therefore means becoming close to him or being with him. And therefore ra, evil, bad, really means the becoming distant from him. All the ultimate ra, ultimate evil or ultimate bad is not physical pain, but becoming distant from him. What is physical pain? Physical pain or a feeling of good sensation, all, re all it really is, is a physical condition. When we feel bad, when we're feeling bad, B-A-D, something bad, really bad, that's not bad. It's a physical condition. That's all it is. And I'm going to describe it soon. That's all it is. It's a physical condition of how we feel. Is it really bad in itself? No. Same thing with good. A person may feel great about something. He may have just won a lot of money. He, he may have you may feel good about something he did. Is that good? No, it's just a description of what he he's feeling. It's not the ultimate good. Let me give you an example. Let's say there's, a, there's a, something going on next door. We don't know what it is exactly because the doors are closed. All we know is that we see an individual with a white gown taking a saw and cutting a person's leg. And that guy whose leg is being cut is squirming in pain, obviously. No anesthesia. <laughs> is that good or bad? It's good. In case the person is a bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> Can we know what's going on in the, from this room if the doors are closed and we don't really hear what's going on? We think that that man cutting the leg is cruel, he's doing something terrible, 
After the doors are open, we walk in and we ask the guy who just lost his leg, are you okay? Is everything fine? Oh, Baruch Hashem, this doctor saved my life. I just had gangrene on my leg, nemic. And had he not cut the leg off, as all of you probably are familiar, right, with these kind of situations, it spreads. You got to remove it. So that is to save his life. So was that bad? That particular act of cutting the leg, was that bad? It's not bad. Because we're looking at the ultimate goal. What was he trying to accomplish? Yes, there was physical pain, but that's all it is. It's a physical pain. The ult we have to look at the whole picture. The ultimate goal was to save his life. We don't always see what is happening. We don't therefore always understand what is going on. Now this particular example that I gave you, all it demonstrates is our lack of understanding. Okay? So rule number one, there's a lot we don't understand. This example you were able to see that you can see something, you think you know what it is, but there's a lot we don't understand. Rule number two, or point number two, there's also something called a cause and effect. Have you heard of that? Cause and effect. You do something, it has an effect. In this world, there is an effect for everything that is done. Moving your hand, looking in, in a certain direction, it all does something. We don't always see the consequences of our actions, but there is something called the cause and effect. Now, for everything that is done, for every action, there is an effect. But what is the problem with this cause and effect rule? that effect does not happen immediately. It can happen many years later. You want to see an example? How long does it take one to get an upset stomach or diarrhea? It could be one hour after he's eaten something that's spoiled. Within one hour, right? And I'm sure most of you have had this experience, right? Within one hour, you can even know what it was because usually it doesn't last too long. You'll get it right away. You'll run to the bathroom. <laughs> An hour, two maybe. How about, that? How about somebody who smokes? Does he know that his lungs are in bad shape right away? No. When does he find out? Maybe 30 years later when he goes and gets a picture of his lungs and they're no longer pink. They're black like, car like carbon, like coal. That's when he finds out, or when he starts coughing every minute. Then he knows that something is wrong. So some things take very long, many, many years, until we see the consequences of that particular action. Therefore, how does this relate to our topic? Many, many times there are masin that are done in this world by certain individuals, certain deeds, certain acts that are not necessarily going to cause an effect immediately. Hashem wants to preserve free will. So we should not immediately see that for doing something right, we're rewarded for doing something wrong, we're, we're punished. He wants, to, he wants to preserve free will. So it could be 20 years down the road where Hashem says, I have an old debt to collect right now from you for something that you did that was not nice 20 years ago. Why now? Hashem knows why. There could be many, many reasons of why 20 years later, why 25 years later, why not 10 years later. There's all sorts of reasons of why Hashem postpones it, delays it for many, many years to come. And it's all for the, a good reason. He knows the reason. But this is what may happen. And therefore, when we're looking at a situation, at an individual who's not behaving himself, we don't know what's going to happen 20 years from now. You think he's just going to go away? You think he's just going to leave this world in peace? Not necessarily. Sometimes yes, but many, many times no. There's a debt that he has to pay, and if he doesn't pay it now, he may pay for it much later. But he's going to pay. it's going to be paid. Because for every cause there is an effect. But the problem is we don't see the effect immediately, so we think or we, or we assume, oh, there's nothing happening with him. It appears that he's getting away with it. Have you seen his whole life? From the day he was born till the day he died, 
where you can actually judge what has happened to him? No, most people don't observe that much. It's a long movie that lasts for 70, 80 years, but people come in the middle. They see somebody who's making tons of money, and he's not keeping Shabbat. His wife is not going to the mikveh. He's not even eating kosher. Nothing. Why is he so blessed? Well, you don't know his whole history. And now we're going to come to the deeper part of this whole enigma of why these people are so prosperous. But what we've done till now is we've, we've covered two important points, and that is one is that we don't have a full understanding because what we think is good is not good. What we think is bad is not bad. Number two, our perception also is not always correct. What we see here, we're seeing right now that this doctor is, or this guy is cutting this leg. We don't fully understand what's going on. And here, on the other hand, we see somebody who's doing something, and we expect to see a, a, a cause and effect, and we don't see it, because it happens many, many years later. We're completely lost. What's going on over here? We, we don't have a full understanding because of the way the system that Hashem created works, that things don't happen immediately, that things may happen much later on. Then there is the third important area called Mazal. Mazal, we've covered, is a package that we were born with pretty much contains with it the tools that we need to fulfill our mission. Part of that mission may have all sorts of terrible experiences, but that is a tikkun and atonement for a previous reincarnation, a previous Gilgul. So it could be that somebody is in this life, a good man, doing everything right, but he has a baggage. And this baggage is from a previous lifetime, and has nothing to do with his current deeds, with his current behavior. And by the way, what came first? The man's behavior or his mazal? Rabbis tell us, 40 days before the formation of the fetus, it has already decided what kind of a life this baby, this baby is going to have. When does he choose to be a tzaddik or a rasha? Sometime after the age of 13. It could be the age of 20. It could be the age of 30, 40, whenever. So what came first? The mazal. The mazal has nothing to do with what that individual is going to do with himself. If he chooses to be a rasha, Hashem does not necessarily remove that mazal that he was born with and replaces it with another mazal. A mazal usually stays intact, which leads to another question, that what is Rosh Hashanah all about? Rosh Hashanah, we're accustomed to saying that Hashem judges the world, Hashem judges every individual, and He decides, makes all sorts of decisions. Well, if there's already a mazal, everything has already been decided from day one. Then what's going to change on Rosh Hashanah? On Rosh Hashanah, Hashem does make decisions whether that mazal will improve or not, or whether it will become worse. That, these changes do occur from time to time. Most of the time, it's the status quo. For a variety of reasons, a person's mazal does not always change drastically. Why? Because that mazal was given to him for a good reason. His tikkun, his whole mission in this lifetime, depends on that mazal. It equips him with the tools that he needs. The hardships that he has to go through, or the, the money that he was given to be able to perform mitzvot. But nevertheless, that day of judgment is a very important day of the year because changes can happen. The Jewish people are above the mazal. They can change a bad mazal to a good mazal. That is the whole idea of wishing somebody mazal tov, that his mazal should become stronger, that even if it's poor, even if it's not so good, that he, he should be blessed, that at some point, you know, it should improve. That can happen. It doesn't always happen because people do not change drastically. Who does change drastically? A Baal Teshuvah. A Baal Teshuvah, one who has repented, he has changed his life completely. I don't know if I should say it because it's a little bit of a, a, uh, a detail that most of you will not understand, but I'll tell it to you uh, in a way that perhaps some of you may understand and some of you will not. I'll, I'll nevertheless mention it. 
There's something called palm reading. In the hand, one can see the life of an individual. There's things that appear in the right hand. There are things that appear in the left hand. It depends if it's a man, depends if it's a woman. There are many things that you can tell about the life of this individual. You can tell about his marriage, how many kids he will have, how many boys, how many girls. More or less how long he will live. More or less whether he will succeed or not. How many losses will he have? How many will he win? How many will he lose? Troubles from his mother-in-law. Troubles from his father-in-law. Troubles from his brothers and sisters. Everything you can imagine. A lot of things. If you know how to read it well, you see everything. There is a particular area in the lifeline where one sees the length of the life in all the major events of that life, not the career, except for the career, where there is a tremendous change. Tremendous change. It's cut, and usually cut means Chaz Shalom, a terrible illness. Don't look at your hands now. <laughs> Why? Because it could be a big change too. It does not necessarily mean an illness. A Bal Teshuvah, because his life has changed so drastically, what may appear in his hands is a, a brand new lifeline or a continuation, of course, of the old one, but after it was cut, which means what? This man has started a new life. It is therefore sometimes possible to see a major change in a person's life through his own will, his own free will. Not a change that simply randomly occurs because nothing just occurs. It's there from the moment the baby exits the mother's womb until that baby dies at the age of 92, most people, their hands are the same. From the moment they are born, as a baby, you know, you see everything, and it stays usually that way. What changes do, do occur? Major changes of a free will nature. He's worked on refining his character. He was stingy by nature and became more giving. He became a Baal Teshuvah. He became a better person. These are things that are so drastic that they, are, they can be observed in one's hand. Why am I telling you all of this? <laughs> it's important to know that even though a person has a mazal, it can be changed. Certain aspects of it can be changed. The area that is more easily changeable, nevertheless, is the area of one's character. Not that you can become a totally different person, you cannot uproot a character. You cannot change your nature completely, but you can control it. You can learn to control it. You can learn to be a better person. So therefore, when one comes into this world with a particular mazal, he should never give up hope, even though we've just said, and we've said it many times, that that is for his tikkun, it's for his good, it's for his benefit. Okay, if it is, then why should he pray to change his mazal? Why should he beg Hashem to give him health and kids if that's his mazal, if that's what's meant to be? We always have to attempt through our special relationship with Hashem, which we have because we are His children, to deal with that mazal through prayer. Because one can change it. What's required may be a lot of Him. It may, it may require a tremendous amount of prayer. It may require a tremendous amount of teshuvah and repentance. Who knows? But it's through one's deeds that they will take place in such a way, in, in, a, in a very abundant way, in a very powerful way that Hashem says, you know what, he's done so much in this other direction that I, that will compensate for the mazal. We don't need to give him that tikkun anymore. He's brought the tikkun on himself in a different way, through constant prayer, through tremendous amount of acts of kindness and charity, or whatever. The tzaddik, therefore, even though he's a tzaddik right now, we don't know what he was in the previous lifetime. We don't know what he's, he needs to go through. And if he's going through, even if he's not a Baal he's from from birth. He's a real tzaddik. Nevertheless, there's a reason for it. And for the most part, if he was always a tzaddik, it has to do with the previous life. Speaking about perception, I said that our perception sometimes is wrong. This is a very important point, too. I said before that we don't always understand everything. Perception is something totally different. What is a wrong, what is a, what is a bad perception, a poor perception? 
we see a, an individual and we think, we perceive his deeds as being that of a tzaddik. We see a rasha, a wicked person, and we perceive him to be wicked. Do we really know the truth? What does Hashem tell? What, 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 it says in the Pasuk, in Sefer Shemuel, Adam yireh la'inaim v'ashem yireh la'levav. That had to do over there with choosing the king of Am Yisrael. Somebody might be impressed by the appearance of an individual, how he looks, handsome and charismatic perhaps, and intelligent. It's an impression. But that could be a wrong impression. Because a human being can only judge by what his eyes see. And that's what actually the halakha says for judges too. A judge doesn't have Ruach HaKodesh, he's not divinely inspired. All he sees is what he sees and what he hears. He has to, based on that, carry out the judgment, decide on, on, uh, on who's right and who's wrong, based on the testimony. He doesn't really know uh, more than that, but that could be faulty. The Hashem yirei levav, but Hashem knows really what's going on in one's heart. So when, what we see is also not always necessarily correct. He, but he's a tzaddik. Who told you he's a tzaddik? What you see, you think that makes him a tzaddik? He's a rasha, but I know he's a rasha. What makes him a rasha? And now I'll tell you why the perception is so wrong. The Rambam says in the Chot Teshuvah, who's a tzaddik and who's a rasha? It's numbers. Whoever has more schuyot, more merits, is a tzaddik. Whoever has more sins, is a rasha. But then the Rambam qualifies this statement. He says, don't think what I just said is a number game. There are sometimes one avera, one sin, that is such a terrible sin that it counts as all the sins put together. In other words, that tzaddik can have many, many mitzvot, but if he has one terrible sin, a tremendous thing that he did, that is accusing him, that is not giving him any peace, a sin that Hashem wants to demand justice right now for the next 10, 15 years or for the rest of his life and not wait for the world to come. Judgment now. There are sins like that. Hashem takes care of it right away. It's so terrible. The numbers of mitzvot and don't matter because that sin will tip the scale. So the Rambam says there are certain mitzvot that are powerful. Even though all he has is one such good deed, it's such a beautiful deed. He saved the Jew's life just one time. But that's a great deed. And he has all these demerits, all these things that are not good on his record, but he has this one mitzvah. So the Ramah says, be careful in how you look at people because it's not just a simple number game. Hashem knows exactly the weight, the value of every mitzvah in Avera. So we can see tzaddikim that they appear to us as righteous individuals, but if they have something on their record, a blemish that is really bad, that would do it, to bring upon them some misery, who knows what. Or the other way around, it could be a rasha who's doing everything wrong, but he did something great because of that one act of chesed or mitzvah, whatever it may be. Hashem says, you know what? I'm going to give him a nice life. He's going to live to the old age of 95. 30 years of social security he's going to receive. Excellent retirement. And he's going to be healthy to the last day. He's not going to be in a coma. He's going to have all his faculties. He's never going to be at the hospital even. Where is it? There are people like that, right? I'm sure all of you know somebody like that who's lived to the 90s and didn't have to go to the doctor. They died in bed. They were never sick. And they smoked two packs of cigar cigarettes every day too. It makes no difference because they, they were blessed with a long life. Why? They did everything wrong. They were not bad people perhaps, but they didn't do any mitzvot. Why do they deserve it? could either be their mazal, which has a reason too. Mazal has a reason for a previous lifetime. Or it could be in this lifetime a particular ma'aseh, a deed that Hashem says, you know what? He's going to have a long life just for that. But what about his debt? He has a lot of debt. Comes upstairs. You were a nice man. You had a good heart. But you don't have deeds. And if you don't have deeds, you don't have the ticket to enter Olam Abba. You're not going to Gehenom, but neither are you going to Olam Abba. So the neshama, of course, is in terrible shape. Where is it going to go? 
they send it back down. That's one possibility. The other possibility is, of course, Gehenam for a number of months. There are various possibilities of what they do to cleanse the Neshama, to give it a second chance. There's all sorts of combinations of what people go through. There's all kinds of mazalot, as we, we spoke about. People having their ups and downs. The first 25 years of their life, good. The next 15 years, terrible. The next, or the last 20, 25 years, good again. It's a galgal, it's a wheel. Some people have it easy all along. Some people have it terrible all along. There's all kinds of mazalot. So therefore, one has to be careful with his perception. That is the meaning of the pasuk in Kohelet. Kohelet, I would, I would rather not say that he makes fun, but that's what he, <laughs> that's what he, it appears that he's doing in his book Kohelet when he uses the term, akol hevel avalim, everything's a bunch of nonsense. Everything, of course, except for the observance of Torah and mitzvot. Everything except for being Yerei Shamaim, God-fearing, which is how he seals his book. But he says it's incredible. He says, yesh tzadikim shemagia lahem kemaase reshaim. There are some tzaddikim that you will encounter in your life that have a life that a rasha deserves it, not a tzaddik. That's how he says, yes, tzaddikim, they are tzaddikim who have a life, like the wicked. They have a very difficult life. And then there's reshaim who have it all good. And he explains it. That this is Hevel, that this is something that we have a hard time trying to figure out. But if you look at the Targum of Yonatan ben Uziel, he explains that it all has to do with the Mazal. It has nothing to do with their life at this, at this moment, with their deeds at this time. Hashem will eventually make a Cheshbon. With the Tzaddik who did all the mitzvot, he will repay him. With the Rasha who committed all the Averot, he will punish him. And don't misunderstand me, punishment is not something bad. Even punishment, as we said all along, is a kapara. Everything that comes from Hashem is good. So the, when we use the word punishment, we have to be careful. We don't use it in a way, I'm going to punish you, I'm upset at you. No, it's to cleanse one. The neshama going upstairs is embarrassed of itself, how full of sins it is. It knows the truth already. It wants to cleave to the Shekhinah. It begs to be, clen to be cleansed. And the cleansing process is an atonement, of course. It's a, it's a way of rectifying what it did unless it comes back in, in another Gilgul. And that reincarnation is an, an additional opportunity to do it on your own. But if you don't do it on your own, they do it for you. It's obviously better if we do it on our own. Another pasuk, v'chen yesh tzadik oved betzitko. There's a tzadik who has a very difficult life despite his righteousness. And that's also, as the Targum says, because of the mazal, that has nothing to do with his current status. Two separate things are independent of each other, the mazal and the current status. And there's a rasha that goes on for many, many years committing the evil that he does. And it appears to us that he's getting away with it. But it's not so. Once we understand that he's fully aware of everything, nothing escapes him, nothing will escape him. Even, even something that was done behind closed doors. He's aware of everything. This requires a certain ashkafa, a certain outlook, a correct outlook, that nothing escapes him. He's aware everything is recorded. When you go upstairs, every little detail that you have completely forgotten, that we think we were right in doing, upstairs we will have to face it. And unless we corrected it, it's recorded in the book. What the Shuvah is all about is erasing the record. We don't want those records to remain intact. We want to destroy them. Otherwise, the Satan has a case. The prosecutor has something to, to talk about. We don't want him to have anything to talk about. That's what the Shuvah helps, to remove those sins from our record. Because of all this lack of understanding, because of the wrong perceptions that we have about wh why things happen, Rabbis love to describe this world as Alma de Shikra. This is a false world, full of lies, full of deceit. In other words, what we see is not necessarily what we get. You know what they say, the term, what you see is what you get. No, not necessarily. We may see something that we think is good, and it may not be so good. Something that is bad is not necessarily so bad. 
It's Alma de Shikra. We don't see everything properly. One of the examples I like to give about a Rasha, who we think is having such a good life, is the example of imagine somebody who's about to be taken to the gallows, and they come and ask him, Last wish, sir. What would you like to have for dinner? Filet mignon? Champagne? Uh, and they will do as he wishes, give him the best food. This is his last meal. Okay. Imagine somebody coming on that day to take a tour of the prison. And they tell him, this prison, they're all condemned to die. All right. So he's expecting to find difficult conditions, you know, dungeons and the like. All of a sudden, he goes by one cell, it's champagne, steak. He says, why don't you let me in too? <laughs> this is a great place to be. You know, in some jails in this country, I hear that they have TVs and they have gyms. And for some people, it's better to be in jail than to be in their own home. Not all jails. What's the warden, is he called? The jail warden, what is he going to say, sir? You don't understand. This man is condemned to die. This is his last meal. We, we let him enjoy it, you know. But he's, he's about to be taken to the gallows. When we see a rasha who's enjoying his life, it may be his last meal. It could be that at the age of 24, he helped someone. Somebody was desperate, and he gave them $3,000, which basically saved their home from being foreclosed on. That's a tremendous favor. The guy, after he was able to pay off the bank, was able to get back on his feet, get a new job, and that $3,000 did it. And he didn't have to do it. It, it. And it was even hard for him to give him the $3,000. It was all his savings, perhaps. And he took a chance. But Shemaim, they know everything. They know how difficult it was. They know what his intentions were. And if they were pure, that counts a lot. Just for that alone, who knows how much reward is coming to him? We don't know. We have no way to measure. But that could be his last meal if everything else in his life is terrible. If he's a good man generally, and just he doesn't know Torah and doesn't do mitzvot, and that's something else. Eventually they'll give him a chance. He doesn't know. I'm not talking about those individuals. I'm talking about somebody who's really, really bad. Evil. Steals from people. Cheats. Does everything you can imagine, all the sins in the world. But at this one, 24 years old, he just happened to have it to open up his heart. That's, that's recorded, and that may help him. But that's his last meal because they don't want to give him anything upstairs, so they give him everything down here. Whereas what, what did we say in the past with tzaddikim? Hashem would prefer the tzaddik to be cleansed down here. So... A lot, of, a lot happens down here. The little good, the last meal, which is good too. It's a reward. And the little punishment or the little atonement to cleanse the tzaddik. That's also good. That's also for his benefit. The tzaddik suffering going through many difficulties in his life, in reality is also a tremendous musar haskel. It's a tremendous valuable lesson for the rasha. Somebody who's observing these two individuals will say, wait a minute, it doesn't pay to be a tzaddik. No, 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 just look at it in a different way. If the tzaddik who does everything right goes through such hardship, can you imagine what's waiting for the rasha? If this is what the tzaddik gets, then can you imagine what the rasha, the evil, the wicked will receive? The same is the other way around too. If a rasha receives so much good and he's a rasha, can you imagine how much good the tzaddik will receive? You can look at it that way too. That is why the, anybody who says that in the Holocaust they saw no God because of all that happened, they're making a big mistake. On the contrary, if the Holocaust can happen, that is the greatest proof that there is a God. Depends how you look at it. The ones who don't believe in God, don't want to believe in a God, they use it as an excuse. How could such terrible things happen to such good people, to kids? On the contrary, if so many terrible things can happen, incredible terrible things can happen to so many good kids and so many good and righteous people, in a, in, in a way that we cannot fully fathom why, 
and especially that it has happened so many times, one after another, it can only be because there is a God that is doing this for a reason that He knows. Because there is no human explanation for it. There's no common sense explanation for this. Why pick them out? Look deeper into it, even though he picked on the gypsies too. Even though they picked on certain minorities. Yes, but this is nothing new. You can see from that event, because of the enormity, that there is a God who allowed that to happen. In, in mentioning the Holocaust, I do want to remind you that when there are terrible decrees, terrible decrees, the rabbis tell us, once the angel of death is given permission to bring about a plague of sorts to a community, he does not distinguish between those who are righteous and those who are wicked. He cannot. Once he's given the decree, everybody goes. So sometimes you're, one is caught. Like in the main, the big plagues that, that, uh, that Europe experienced, the bubonic plague, the black plagues, you have people just file, fall like flies. The, the, the righteous too. Once the mashchit, the angel of death, of destruction, is given permission to destroy a community, has v'shalom, depending what the reasons are, but if it's supposed to be a terrible gezerah, that a mashchit comes in, he doesn't distinguish. Hashem does distinguish. Where do we see that? In Mitzrayim, Makat Bechorot. He knew, he was able to distinguish who is the Bechor firstborn, who's not. An angel does not know. So if an angel is given, a destructive angel, given permission to wipe out a, a, a country, people get caught. Now you might say, well, well, he's a tzaddik. Don't worry, Hashem will take care of the tzaddik. He will bring him back. He will, he will send him to Gan Eden. Hashem will take, but the death will come because he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. So a mashchit, a malach mashchit, sometimes takes everybody at the same time. Yes. That's why Lot had to leave too. Lot was not such a big tzaddik that he could remain in Sdom Vamora, have everything collapse around him, and remain alive. He was an only en enough of a tzaddik because of the schut of Abraham, his uncle, to get saved, and, but he had to leave. He was even told not to look back because he was not righteous enough to see the, the city that he grew up with, that he lived there, being destroyed. He, not even that, did he, he did not even have a zechut for that. So he, had, he could not look back. His wife looked back, of course, and uh, she has become a tourist attraction today. A pillar of salt. Yeah. Yeah. Just to conclude, we've been talking quite a bit, and we'll still be talking in the next two weeks about various kinds of suffering. Uh, we'll be talking in the next two weeks about why people die before their time. That's another question by itself. They were supposed to live to 83, and they left at 50. According to their mazal, 83, but something happened, they left at 50. Question number two, why do children die when they're young, before bar mitzvah even? So these are similar questions, but nevertheless it's the same kind of idea, because w even though we're explaining some important concepts tonight, these are a little bit different. They involve something else. And it's important to understand it because, unfortunately, we see this in our lives, and we would like to have some understanding of why these things happen. So if somebody ever asks you, how come this happened? He doesn't deserve it. He was a righteous child. He never did anything wrong. Or why did the parents deserve to have this happen to them? There's a reason for it. But I want to just conclude for tonight with a Baal Teshuvah. We discussed this in the past. Baal Teshuvah, those whose life has changed. Life has changed drastically. And all of a sudden, they say, okay, I'm great now, I'm nice now, I'm, I'm putting on tefillin shel Rashi and tefillin shel Tam, I'm waking up and praying at the nets early in the morning, I'm keeping everything just right, and all of a sudden, he loses his job, everything goes wrong. You, you would think that everything would just go right now. No, on the contrary, everything turns around for the worse. What did we say, what did we say at the very beginning of the lecture? Is, it, is that bad? It appears bad, it feels bad. But that's all it is. It's a feeling. It's a physical condition that he's going through. That's not bad. That's good. It's an atonement. Hashem loves him now. Hashem lo Who does he, Hashem rebuke? Those he loves. Those he cares about. You have become my son now. You've done Teshuvah. Now I care about you. I'm going to clean you up now. Now this Baal Teshuvah, usually, if you pay attention, this is what you should do if you have somebody like that. Give him encouragement. Tell him, listen, on the average, we don't have statistics. But on the average, if this is the reason why this is happening to you, that Hashem is cleansing you, 
you'll see in three years from now, maybe five, maybe more, you're going to get back to where you were before. Depending how bad he was when he was younger, how much cleaning he has to go through, but on the average, I've seen this, three years, five years, give or take, he's going to get back on his feet. Then you will know that that was a tremendous kapara. That is what the Pasuk says, Lo yiten le'olam mot la tzaddik. Hashem will never allow a tzaddik to collapse. He may go after him, he may refine him, he may send him a package of pain and suffering, but it's all to cleanse him, it's all for his good. It's better to do it here than in the world to come. Another pasuk that says the same idea, Lo ra'iti tzaddik ne'ezav, ezarom evakesh lachem. Hashem does not abandon the tzaddik completely. He may be poor, but he will not be completely abandoned. Completely abandoned, that Hashem doesn't take care of. There's no such thing. If he's a tzaddik, Hashem takes care of all the tzaddikim. They may have it difficult, but that's a physical condition. It's not bad. It's good. There's a very, very beautiful story with the Chafetz Chaim that tells you all. It tells you how people see life in the wrong way. And because they see life in the wrong way, they think that what they're doing is correct and they continue to do whatever it is that they're doing that is wrong. The Chafetz Chaim needed to print one of his sefarim. I don't remember if it was the Mishnah Berura or another sefer, another book. In those days, in that country, you needed to get permission from the censor. Is that how it's called in English? The the president w- charge, yeah. To look over the book that there's nothing against the government. All right. Now, this book is in Hebrew. So who do you think the censor for Hebrew books is going to be? A Jew. (laughs) Well, a Jew that works for the government. Usually, these kind of Jews who were censors were not very, very religious. On the contrary, they were left camp, secular, enlightened, not, not too much believers. So the Chafetz Chaim goes up to the office of the censor, and the censor, we're talking about an older man now, Chafetz Chaim, maybe in his 60s or 70s. And he meets up with the censor. And the censor tells the Chafetz Chaim, Israel Meir, that was the name of the Chafetz Chaim, Israel Meir Akohen. Israel Meir, don't you remember me? I was your classmate. They were classmates. And, of course, it's been many, many years. And he would never think that this is a classmate of his. What are you doing working here? He says, look at you. He was pointing to the cheap, simple, plain clothes that the Chafetz Chaim was wearing. He looked poor. Look at me. Look at the comfortable chair, the position that I have, the way I look. Look at your life and look at my life. You see what you did? What, what nonsense! You have to come now begging me for a signature because of your books, because of your beliefs. This is where you are. Look at where I am. Look at where you are. Don't you want to be like me? So the Chafetz Chaim tells him, let me tell you a mashal, a story, a parable. There was once a poor individual who was standing on the road trying to hitch a ride. After all, whoever did not have money in those days had to walk. Unless you were lucky, somebody did you a favor and gave you a ride. So he was standing, this poor fellow was standing in the road. All of a sudden, from a distance, he sees a beautiful chariot with beautiful horses adorned, approaching a nice man dressed well, coming over to this poor man to tell him, would you like a ride? Now imagine taking a ride, not only getting to where you need to get, but in a comfortable wagon in good company. So this poor fellow asks the man, where are you going? And the rich man tells him the opposite direction of where he was going. Imagine some of you may have today to go to Pico Robertson or wherever it is that you live, and somebody offers you a ride to Rancho Cucamonga or to uh, (laughs) some opposite direction. So he says, I'm sorry, thank you very much, but I have to refuse your your invitation. You're headed in the wrong direction. So the Chafetz Chaim turns to his friend and says, thank you, but no thank you. I don't want to go where you're going in the afterlife. We're both headed in totally different directions. (laughs) You understand what he means. 
Obviously, the Chafetz Chaim prefers this lifestyle because he knows where he needs to go, even if he has to walk, even if he has to go there slowly, but he's going to get there safe. He has to refuse the invitation of this man because he's headed in a totally different direction. What can we do? People are unaware of it because their perception is not, not good. They see things that are beautiful and bright and sparkling, money, swimming pools, jacuzzis. This man built himself a mansion. Is that the life you want? Is that the direction you, where you want to go? You know what this leads to? There's nothing wrong with the mansion, don't get me wrong, but it's the emphasis, the lifestyle. This is the totally opposite direction. We must realize this, that we should not be misled. We should not be misguided. And that, that's what Moshe talks about too in last week's parasha. There are many things that can mislead people, many things that can misguide them in thinking that this is right and it's completely wrong. Be very, very careful. And that is the importance of learning the right hashkafot, having the right values of what is right and what is wrong, what is important and what is unimportant, what is shtuyot, what is nonsense, what you should pursue, what you should not pursue. Because what appears to be nice may not be so nice after all. And it, and it may not even last that long. It may be something that is so superficial, something that is artificial, something that is completely not worth our trouble. Whereas the Torah, Dosha, Kiem Hayenu Ve'orach Yemenu, we know our life depends on this. Even though it does not appear so shiny, it appears a little difficult perhaps to live a life committed to Torah Mitzvot. But we know that this is the direction where we want to go. And Bezat Hashem, we should remain in this direction for the rest of our life. Thank you.